My name is Brett Richards, and I'm the CEO of Goldshore Resources. Goldshore Resources is a, a mid-stage exploration and development company working on the Moss Gold Project in Northwestern Ontario. And we are on a journey to becoming Canada's next tier one gold asset. On May the 8th, 2023, and after over two years of working the project, we put out a mineral resource estimate. And, and that estimate is 6 million ounces of gold at 1.02 grams. But the real story contained within that is the 6 million ounce resource has 3.35 million ounces of it at 1.84 grams per ton of gold. It is a significant portion of the deposit, which is high grade. So let's talk about what makes for a successful project, what makes for a successful investment. I use five key criteria for evaluating mining projects. It's about the people, it's about the location, it's about the size and scale and the potential, and it's about access to infrastructure. And it's also about grade and metallurgy. So these are the things that I like to talk about because these are the questions investors need to ask. When we talk about the team, you know, I've been in this business over 34 years. My partner, Pete Flindell, has been in the business the same amount of time. Um, Peter is uh, the VP of Exploration. I am the CEO. And Marlos Yassin is our CFO. This is our corporate team. That's it. We don't have anybody else. We want to keep our GNA low and we want to get as much um, money going into the ground to develop the, uh, the resource as possible. We have come from a number of companies of tremendous success. I cut my uh, teeth in early my career with Kinross and moved on to be one of the founders of Katanga Mining uh, in 2004, which turned into an 80, 80 plus times money for early seed investors. Beyond that, I, I went and ran uh, a very successful company called Avocet Mining and also Rocks Gold. Most recently, Pete and I have worked together for private equity clients that we have that uh, require large teams, small teams of, of mining experts to do a number of things, whether that's rehabilitation, refinancing, or, or operational management. Uh, this is what we do. Coming to Goldshore was a tremendous opportunity for us because we saw the size and scale of it, and that's why we're here. Um, so we have tremendous background of delivering value to shareholders. Our board has tremendous value, uh, tremendous track record delivering value to shareholders as well. Uh, and you can look up the, the names and the companies that they run and the companies that have been involved with. And this is a very dynamic, very nimble team of people. We move very quickly. We move very methodically, but we do it with extremely strong governance and and uh, and strategy. Let's talk about the place, the Moss Gold Project. We're in northwestern uh, Ontario, which is in Canada, um, uh, northwest of the Great Lakes, and we're about a hundred kilometers west of a major city called Thunder Bay. We're right in the middle of multiple gold districts: the Red Lake uh, District, the Timmins Belt, and the Abitibi District. And this is called the the Shabandawan Greenstone Belt. And it is a, a Archean uh, uh, formation that that was never really on the radar. Uh, these low grade type deposits and low grade mineralized uh, areas of of, uh, of Ontario were never of any interest when gold was at five hundred dollars or four hundred dollars or even as low as two two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, they simply you know weren't commercial uh, at those numbers. But when gold starts to hit twelve hundred and fifteen hundred dollars, they they tend to be very commercial. And today at 1950, you know, these areas are, are have tremendous potential. Uh, this is uh, the breakdown of our, of our uh, uh, 6 million ounce resource. Um, about 5.4 5. Uh, 5 million ounces of it is at Moss. And the balance of it is at East Coldstream, which is about 10 kilometers away. But collectively, we have uh, 6 million ounces at 1.02 grams. When we uh, embarked on this process of getting involved with the, um, with the project, our VP of exploration, Pete Flindell said to me, Brett, you know, we need to fly this. We need to fly VTEM survey over this, MAG survey over this, so we can understand the context of what we've got. We acquired a 4 million ounce historic resource. The data was available. 
However, a lot of the data was not usable because of the, the age of it, the lack of QA, QC, the lack of you know, certificates, and the lack of uh, you know, quality core. Um, so we, we did a complete audit of all of that information. We, we kept everything and we used what we could to uh, you know, start our model. But it gave us a good starting point and a reference point for our, our, uh, our drilling program which commenced in June of 2021. The three areas here are the moss um, uh, pits. The, this area here um, up in the Northeast, this white dot is uh, east, uh, North Coldstream and the one beside it's East Coldstream. But we have 22 other high priority gold targets that look exactly like moss. So although we have 6 million ounces of moss, we have tremendous uh, drilling and target potential to grow this resource as we say, towards a tier one, um, a tier one deposit. We also have numerous um, VMS um, style deposits and a historic copper and cobalt mine on our project called called North Coldstream. So there is tremendous potential here from a copper and cobalt uh, standpoint, as well as obviously the gold is the primary strategy here. But again. Every gold company, every major gold company in this world is also a copper company. It's the nature of the beast with VMS and porphyries, whereby, you know, they, they deal with, with, uh, with copper as well. So tremendous optionality, tremendous upside. Looking at the original 2013 Innova Explorer resource, this is what it looks like. This is the Moss deposit and one of the things back then, they, they did not have a good understanding of the geological controls. That was quite obvious when we, when we remodeled the data sets. And looking at this, it, it became very apparent we were going to have to do some infill drilling uh, in addition to some verification drilling on this deposit. And after 79,000 meters, we put out the resource estimate on May the 8th, and the resource now looks like this. You can see, as I toggle back from the old to the new, it's grown uh, substantially by 50%. But I, again, I, I say the real story is these, these broadly mineralized shears that go right through the deposit that we've modeled. And there are more in parallel uh, to this deposit. They are going to require more drilling. But this is going to drive the economics of our PEA or our preliminary economic assessment we're in the in the middle of doing it right now. We've commenced it two weeks ago, and we are now, uh, you know, proceeding with uh, with a PEA. But when we start to sequence a mine plan, these shears are going to deliver tremendous grade and head grade to the plant in the early years of the of the uh, mine life, which means cash flow uh, will be um, will be extremely attractive in the front end of the mine plan which means it will bring cash flows forward. It will also increase the NPV of this project uh, when we kind of get through all of the economic analysis. This is a cross section of it. And the reason we can sequence these, uh, these shears is because they're sub-vertical. They run up and down and they outcrop its surface. We have a very, very small overburden here and we have a very small and shallow water course that we will be, uh, we will be uh, dewatering over uh, the, the, the process of permitting. So, you know, I know there have been lots of questions about our water course, but quite frankly, it, it is uh, just part of our, our process of permitting, part of our process of prepping the site for, for, um, for production. But these shears uh, sub-vertical, we have drilled down a thousand meters and these shears still hold grade at a uh, thousand meters down. So this could potentially have a long-term, you know, underground potential and when we talk about a thousand meters uh, where we have drilled, you know, there's definitely uh, there's definitely um, you know larger uh, a, a much much larger resource here. I failed to put numbers to it because you know you could easily come up with fifteen or twenty million ounces uh, on the back of a napkin. But again, that's arm waving. And before we we start to talk about numbers like that, we need to do more drilling. But the the potential is definitely there. This is the pit shell that we put around the resource. It's been constrained with a $1,650 gold price, uh, which we think is appropriate because the majors use this. This is the consensus gold price that 
the, the banks uh, have long-term consensus price. So this is what the majors use for assessing resources. So this is what we have put in. And we use $2.50 for mining as an input, $12.50 for processing, and $2.50 for um, GNA. And, and again, those are the inputs that are used by major mining companies. Rather than the typical junior mining promotion where they use $1,700, $1,800, dollars gold, uh, because it delivers more ounces and a more robust economic view. But in reality, that is not what, what happens. And, and I think investors see through that. This is when I talk about potential at Moss. There's, there's multiple scales of potential here. There's the micro scale, the potential of growing this resource laterally down towards this area where it says eight kilometers because there's known drilling down here and there are known shears down here. There's a little bit of drilling to the southwest, uh, about a do half a dozen holes, which we think will, with some more drilling, will will deliver, uh, you know, these these shears in continuity. Um, but again, that's going to take drilling. There is a large area to the the southeast um, of uh, the Moss deposit, which again illustrates that there are ad additional shears uh, running along this area. But the potential to the northeast is tremendous, and you can see where. All the historic drilling doesn't come into the resource because of drill spacing. And you can see the red holes, anything over one gram, which is going to kind of align perfectly with these, uh, these shears being contiguous. They're not going to be straight, they're going, but they are going to be contiguous. So a lot of potential to grow the resource in many different directions here. That is the micro growth. When you look at kind of the more kind of um, th this micro growth at depth, you can see now where this resource is going to grow at depth. And the, these pit shells are gonna come down substantially, probably down six, 700 meters um, and, and, and go to underground from there. So tremendous potential underneath, tremendous potential along strike and tremendous potential laterally. This is East Coldstream, it has two mineralized shears. It's, it's much smaller as we know, it's about 600,000 ounces in total. It's separated by this diabase dike, um, and you know it is. Uh, it'll be economic. It'll be a small pit, uh, but it'll be uh, it'll be reasonably economic, and we will sequence that into the mine plan when we you know start to need uh, to uh, optimize grade. Uh, we will sequence it in at the appropriate time. Our view is Greece Coldstream is not going to sequence in in the first five years, maybe six years. And, uh, but we'll see, you know, this is again, just our, our theory. Uh, we have to engineer this. This is one of the anomalies in our, in our project, which is North Coldstream deposit. Um, this is a historic mine. You can see the historic workings in it, but we drilled on the outskirts of the, the known deposit and we hit a whole um, 62 meters of 0.88% copper equivalent at surface which contains 0.09 cobalt. Uh, this is meaningful. This is very high grade when it comes to copper and copper mines. <clears throat> copper mines go down as low as 0.2% copper, uh, <clears throat> but they also go as high as 5% copper. And the Katanga project I worked on in, in the DRC had um, <clears throat> an average reserve grade of 5%. So North Coldstream uh, offers us tremendous um, uh, potential to drill this out and understand the economic viability of this. We have four other targets just like this. It's open at depth. It's open along uh, our known strike. So we, we need to drill this and critical minerals are as important today as gold is uh, when it comes to you know, market, um, you know, market uh, perception, uh, market uh, desire. And from the, the demand side of things, you know, copper and cobalt, probably more important when it comes to critical minerals and, and electric vehicle uh, production. So w when I talk about size and scale, and it's the, the I think the most compelling uh, feature of our, of our project is, is where this could go long-term. This is generational um, uh, mining. This is a mine that will start and 50, 60, 70 years down the road will still be in production and will grow and will grow into possibly neighboring properties as well. But this is the, the beginning of a large district scale mining camp for the Shabandawan Greenstone Belt. 
and we have the core of it. We have the heart of that belt tied up here in this 35 kilometer long land package, over 18,000 hectares. Um, that is, uh, you know, the, the heart of the Shabandawan Greenstone Belt. And then the next factor is the, what I call the doability factor, access to infrastructure. We are located, our project is on the Trans-Canada Highway, four-lane highway that goes coast to coast in Canada, starts in Toronto and then picks up uh, and is called Highway 11 and goes all the way out to Manitoba. Uh, this is important from an access standpoint, but there's other access points here that are equally as important. We have two major international rail companies on our site or just off our site with rail spurs. We have access to an international port in Thunder Bay, which is about 100 kilometers away. And we have all the access to all of these targets and sites at Hamlin, Moss, Coldstream, Iris, all with winter roads um, and, 20, and, and 12 month a year access to, to all of these sites. But the most important thing is that we have power on our site, Trans-Canada Power. So we have an unlimited supply of, of power, uh, very, very inexpensive power, 10 cent kilowatt hour power at today's going rate. And again, being close to a major city like Thunder Bay, where you have people and contractors and, and government uh, officials is very, very important to building a big district scale mining camp. And all of those things that combined really kind of reduce the risk dramatically from a doability factor. And from an attraction standpoint, from working on this project, people can live in Thunder Bay and this project can bus people from Thunder Bay to site and then home at night and they can be home with their families every night. And that is a tremendous advantage when building a camp, not fly in, fly out. Um, so we don't have to put people up and, 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 and cater to them. You know, those are costs, capital costs, they're operating costs, and they're expensive. So we have that luxury of, of potentially having our workforce live in Thunder Bay. And the last piece of kind of those five key criteria is really about grade and metallurgy. And we've talked about 55% of the, the moss deposit being at uh, 1.84 grams per, per ton. Uh, tremendous grade relative to low grade open pit development stage projects in Canada and the US. We have one of the highest grade projects uh, in that category. And you can see some of the extremely high grades we have uh, delivered um, uh, through, um, uh, through our drill program. We have done extensive work on, on metallurgy and we continue to today, whereby you know, the moss deposit has you know, 93% recovery in bottle rolls and East Coldstream 96, 98% recovery in bottle rolls. Um, again, tremendous results. And we are also exploring the, the option of having heat bleach as a solution for the lower grade mineralization, which will have an impact on CapEx from a standpoint that will build a smaller plant because smaller tonnage will be going through a plant. And uh, you know we're trying to come up with that balance at the end of the day as to what that looks like. And that requires a lot of metallurgical testing, requires a lot of engineering, a lot of mineralogy studies, uh, department uh, studies. Um, we, we, so we need to do all of this analysis, and this is what we're doing throughout the uh, the PEA period. So the last thing I, I talk about to investors is the investment thesis. You're here, you're listening to me about how uh, Goldshore is and what they're all about. What I want to share with you, though, is about how I'm going to make you money, how Goldshore is going to make you money. The downside risk of our project is, is, is quite minimal. We have cash in the bank today of $6 million. Um, we have a market cap today, which is around $40 million uh, Canadian and a share price around 20 cents today. Um, we IPO'd at 65 cents. So we also are part of that junior mining segment that are off 60%. And, you know, a tremendous, uh, starting point uh, for investors who want to see this through to it through its development stages and to some form of of uh, of, of liquidity event, whether that's a whether that is a transaction or whether that is us going into production. I think there is scope for 
you know, tremendous share price growth. And the reason I say that is because today we're trading at around $7 an ounce. And our peer group trades around $25 or $30 an ounce on average. And our high grade peer group trade around $80 on average. There are some at 100, there's some at 60. But that is a, a good correlation to, you know, kind of where we should be trading, where our re-rate will come. Um, we have a real project and the project is has been defined. We have 6 million ounces, 3.3 million ounces of high grade material, as high grade as, as our projects and our peers to the right of this chart. So, you know, will we trade down to two or three dollars an ounce? I, I really, really doubt it. Um, are, have we got the ability to re-rate as the market gets familiar with the story? gets familiar with our PEA in September, October, when we deliver the results of that, I think that that's going to be the case. We're going to see a $30, $40 uh, per ounce uh, company because that is, that is who we should be today. And, 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 you know, I, I appreciate that is five or, or six times money from where we are today, but that is the potential we have on a conservative basis. We have performed what I would call nothing less than exceptional over the past two years. It costs us $10 an ounce to, to find this. This is all in costs, including acquisition, GNA. This is not drilling costs. Our drilling costs would be half that or, you know, six, $7 an ounce, but our all in costs are $10 an ounce. We're trading at $7 an ounce today. We're trading below our discovery costs. And these are the best highest decile costs in our sector. You know, typical costs of discovery are $30 an ounce, $35 an ounce. That's how our business frames an inferred resource. Six million ounce inferred resource, $30 an ounce. We're getting seven today. So a bit of a disconnect from the market. We also found 76 ounces of gold for every meter drilled. And I think that's a that's pretty pretty impressive, and that's a metric that not everybody looks at. But that is, um, you know, over the seven over the seventy eight thousand meters drilled to date, that is, you know, tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, result. When we look at our peers who are even further advanced, um, and you know, the detours and the Cote Lakes of the world uh, in production or you know getting into production. The grade of all of these is, is, in my view, one of the most important things. Yes, tonnage and metallurgy and all those things are important, but grade really makes up for everything. And when you're running 0.9 grams or 0.7 grams or 0.6 grams, you really don't have a lot of room for error and you, you, can, you can have volatility in your valuation. When you're running three gram material through your head grade through your plant, it is, um, it is pretty meaningful because for every ton of ore you touch, you're getting three or four or five times the revenue than, than your peers are. And that's a tremendous advantage. And on our global resource coming down to one grams, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. But the potential of all these other targets are going to you know, pr provoke us uh, to go look at them and we are going to go drill them out. And so instead of having a big one deep pit at Moss, you're going to have a, a, a shallow pit at Moss and maybe five shallow pits at Moss and maybe 10 along strike and maybe one laterally because it's much cheaper to go to, you know, to go to a, a different pit than it is to go deeper because our grade will come down. So, you know, in all, in, in all cases that that may not be the case in all cases, but in most cases we, we will chase grade because that's what miners do. Exploration geologists present the, the resource to you, miners, our job is to optimize um, cash flows, maximize cash flows, and chasing grade is one of those things that, that we will do over you know, the first 10 or 15, 20 years of, uh, of our production. So what we have right now on the go is our preliminary economic assessment. We're going to be putting that out in kind of September, early October. That's how I'm guiding. I don't have a date for people yet, and we won't have a date for several months. But we're working on that resource, and there's a number of things we're preparing for uh, as far as drilling goes. We're getting ready to 
to uh, to infill. We're getting ready to do our, our geotech drilling and sterilization drilling, looking at new targets, etc. So we're going through and prioritizing all of that. So we have a lot of district exploration targets to do. Uh, we have more MET test work to do next year, uh, column testing, um, advanced column column testing. Um, so those will be uh, some of the activities later on in the year and into next year. Um, and we want to get this to a pre-feasibility study by kind of the end of this year. And that's going to dovetail into everything that we've said, everything we've done, everything we've delivered on will culminate in the next study, which will be a pre-feasibility study, which will take about a year. And, um, you know, that is the point in time when we will assess, you know, we will assess where we are with our environmental baseline work, prepare the remaining work that has to be done. And the beauty about that is it, we targeted this so we could flag anything that was going to be critical to permitting early on, <clears throat> whether that was, uh, you know, dewatering of uh, the, the water basin that uh, is nearby, whether that is rerouting rivers, whether that is species or flora or fauna. We went through all of those studies and we worked with the ministry in some areas. And quite frankly, we have no red flags. So the environmental risk of this project is right now green flag. And as we move forward, we'll continue to advance into stage two uh, and then get into our impact assessment um, uh, in, state, in phase three. That work just dovetails right along towards our pre-feasibility. So when I look at Gold Shore, it really does check all the boxes. We have the people, we have the place, the location, we have the potential of which I've described. We have access to infrastructure to build a major operation here over a long period of time. And we have the grade and metallurgy that will deliver, that will deliver you know, certainly a uh, higher grade and, and a competitive advantage to our peers, but also metallurgical recoveries that are going to be top, top quartile uh, in our sector. So I think Gold Shore ticks all the boxes of those five key attributes when you are looking for an investment in mining projects. Thank you for a great presentation, Brett. Um, now, the first segment of the Q&A will focus on the people, story, and shareholders of the company. We will then proceed to dive into MOSS, followed by the final segment on strategy and capital markets. So first of all, Brett, could you just give a bit of background color on what led up to the founding of Gold Shore Resources back in January 2021? Yes, I, I think the concept uh, leading up to the acquisition of Gold Shore uh, or, or the Moss project from West Dome was architected by our, our chairman, Gala McNamara. And one of our advisors, uh, David Garofalo, uh, was involved in the early days as well. And it's about sharing views and sharing you know, where do you think the gold price is going to go? Where do you think, uh, where do you think uh, these low grade projects are going to fit into that? And, you know, it started to align very quickly that there was a lot of areas of under exploration, uh, under explored areas in Canada that people are now starting to look at for opportunity. And Galen uh, heard about uh, West Dome running a process to sell the, sell the, the Moss project. And uh, and he got very in, you know, very involved in it. I got pulled into it as an investor early on, and uh, and saw the potential, and and quite frankly was living in London at the time, and 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 you know and and still kind of my base is you know not in Canada, but we have a summer home here in Canada, and it said hey I'll spend more time here, and uh, and we'll I'll focus on this project. Uh, Pete Flindell, who is my partner. He's the VP of Exploration for Gold Shore Resources. He was living in Malaysia and moved his family to Thunder Bay. So we have Pete on the project. We have me close to the capital markets. And, and really, that's our corporate structure at the end of the day. But, um, you know, we, we think it works well because we can, we can keep G&A down and we can maximize the money kind of going into the ground. But I, I, I got involved in this and brought Pete along because... You know, not only do I see this as a great investment, I see this as, all, you know, this is something I wanted to run. You don't get very many chances in your career at a 10 bagger. And, and when you see it, you, you want to be a part of it. And, and I want to be a part of it from the beginning. About your, your career before Gold Shore, can you kind of touch on what work you did specifically? Were you part of operations, you know, 
what were your roles to your previous comp- uh, companies? Yeah, l- leading up to uh, you know to w- where I am today, my background is in, in engineering, both mechanical and mining engineering, and I also have an advanced business degree. Um, Pete is a is a geologist. He's got a degree in, in, in exploration geology, and uh, our, we complement each other. I, I actually started in the metals business um, for the first fifteen years of my career, uh, working in the steel business, and you know it's very very similar to mining. It's capital intensive. It is um, you know it is uh, there's a lot of similarities when it comes to you know the usage of metals, the trading of metals, etc. And and I I was an engineer um, in a steel company uh, right up until the time when we were bought by a company called Gerdau. I was the chief operating officer. And I went and worked for uh, Kinross after that for a guy by the name of Bob Buchan. And, uh, and, and you know, quite frankly, was a part of his, his vision to grow Kinross into kind of a multi-company, multi-mine company. And he was well on his way when, when I went there. But I ended up you know, being fortunate to be exposed to, you know, projects be, being kind of the, the you know, general management side of things. Uh, you know, all the way from running administration, all the way to running the technical teams, running, uh, you know, the, the general management side of the business, you know, in, in various areas around the world, whether it's in Eastern Russia, um, you know, Chile, uh, Brazil, Nevada. Um, and in 2005, uh, we left, uh, with another gentleman who was working with Ken Ross at the time was a guy named Art Ditto. And we were the founders of a company called Katanga Mining. And uh, we seeded it uh, with $25 million. And four years later, after a major acquisition of a company called Nicanor and the London Exchange, um, we, uh, we exited to Glencore for uh, $2 billion. Now, Katanga Mining uh, has one of the most robust, highest grade and, and biggest size copper and cobalt deposits in the world. I think 11% of the world's cobalt is under reserve at Katanga Mining. I think another 11% is at Tenke Fugurume, and another kind of 4 or 5% is at Kamo and Kalua, um, which is Ivanhoe. But the DRC holds 80% of the world's cobalt, and uh, it, it's kind of uh, you know contained within those three companies, four companies. So I had a, a tremendous opportunity, and I saw the potential of Katanga being a 10-bagger. It turned out to be an 80-bagger uh, for, for, for people. After that, I, I was asked to run a gold company called Avocet Mining, and it's where I got involved with Pete in a big way. Pete was uh, in charge of Southeast Asia. We had two operating mines, uh, and we had a number of exploration projects uh, in the Philippines, in Kalimantan, in Indonesia, uh, and in Malaysia, and Pete was in charge of that. And I, uh, we would acquired a company, and we were building a mine in Burkina Faso at the time. We acquired a a Norwegian company called Vega Mining. And uh, we were building uh, the Anata mine in northern northern Burkina Faso. And Pete and I kind of came together at that point in time um, and led the, uh, I was the CEO. We led the, uh, the, the, the construction and the, and the uh, ultimate commissioning of the mine. Did around 180,000, 200,000 ounces a year. Um, and uh, we delivered in my time with Kinra, or sorry, my time with Avaset. I, I, you know, we delivered shareholders. We were thirty p, and we exited for around uh, uh, one pound eighty, one pound ninety. Uh, but we had a high of two eighty, so it was, um, you know, a, a good, a good return for our shareholders there. And it's what I focused on. I focused on managing the cap structure, keeping the equity story alive, and generating cash flow. We paid dividends to our shareholders. Um, because, you know, this is the, the model that we, we live by and we have capital discipline and we don't go do deals for the sake of doing deals. We do the right deals. And, um, and I, and I think that that is a disciplined approach beyond that. I was asked to restructure rocks gold, took a year, um, and, and it became a tremendously successful company. And since then, Pete and I have been, you know, we've been working for private equity who we've made money for over the past 10 years. And we've been on a number of projects uh, in Africa and uh, other parts of the world, the Philippines. Uh, we've done, a, we've, Pete has done 12 feasibility studies in his career. We've taken projects up from early exploration all the way into feasibility study. That is Pete's forte. 
my forte is yes, capital markets, but my forte and my experience as an engineer is really uh, taking these projects and getting them in through construction, commissioning them and getting them into steady state production. And beyond that, you know, operating companies and and uh, and running mines, which which I did at Avocet, but. This is the fun stuff. This building companies up from this stage is the fun stuff. It's where you get from the little sawn curve. It's where you get the biggest bang for your buck. You get uh, the biggest return. And as an investor now, um, you know, this is something that uh, this is the, the sweet spot that I like to get involved in in companies. Yeah, so, so you obviously have a, a very successful career with a lean management team. But looking at the board, how active are the board members? Of course, they are very skilled. They have their own roles as uh, in different management teams in the industry. But what do they contribute to the company? They actually contribute a lot. This is not um, like uh, a, a normal board. Yes, you know, I consider all these men and women, you know, they're 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 friends uh, because you know we we get along and we get along because we have the same vision. We have the same vision and the same, I'll say, mission to to achieve that vision. Um, we, 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 we agree strategically on where this company should go. I've known some of the people on the board for many years and some of the people we brought on the board, I, I, I don't know, but one thing in common is we're very aligned and I rely on successful people. I'm a collaborative type manager. I'm a, a collaborative type person. I like to get input from many sources before I make a decision. You know, I, I, I don't like to say, Hey, my, it's my way or the highway. And having a board of a balanced board that has, they're all from different demographics, different ages, different commodities, that diversity uh, is ex extremely important because I like to hear their point of view. And quite frankly, hey, I'm one of the older generation, let's say being in this business for 37 years, I'm one of the older generation that, you know, we, we don't, um, we don't market, we're not used to marketing on Twitter, we're not used to marketing on all these mediums that you know junior mining companies market on. I'm used to going out and taking face-to-face -face meetings, shaking hands, and telling sto the story to to somebody face to face. And I still do that, and I do that regularly on Zoom. Uh, and through COVID, we had to do that, but I still like to get out there face to face. But some of my board members bring in that technological advancement where. They're very advanced on social media, marketing, advertising, et cetera, promoting their company, telling their story through different avenues and different mediums. And I have piggybacked on that. I've been the benefactor of that. They know I am, I am the, uh, the older guy in the room, but uh, so they help me. And, and quite frankly, it's been tremendously successful. I collaborate with them on my style. They collaborate with me on, you know, on, on their style. And I think that, that um that 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 collaboration that inclusivity i think is tremendously important and the fact we have a very diverse board um of 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 where people are are from and also where people are you know positioned and working gives a different perspective and you can always use you know greater diversity um but you know you 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 need to be you know, quite inclusive in your uh, in your behaviors and in your actions and and I have tremendous interactions with some of my board members. They're very close to our company. Uh, they, uh, they, um, they, they, they promote my company. They, I promote their company because they're good stories and they will, they will um, endeavor to, to make their shareholders uh, money. This is what it's about. You, it's a commitment and a relationship with shareholders to make you money and protect the downside and, and manage the risk along the way. Uh, for shareholders, and, and and that's what we do. We're this is not a job. This is a relationship. Looking at the shareholders, obviously between management and the board, we saw that you own ten percent. Then you have Westom, um, you know, a, a fairly large gold producer that you acquired the project from, and they own about twenty percent of the company now. So, what what is your current relationship with Westom? How they have two board members, but how active are they in the process? running the company yeah they're they're they're, they're not active in, in running the company um they you know yes they have two board representatives and and uh that was the you know the relationship we had from the outset 
they they originally had 29.9 percent of the company they've been diluted down through time and they're sitting at 19. Uh, i think uh, you know west Dome is a high grade underground producer and they have a tremendous valuation on a per ounce of production basis probably if not the highest in the, in the in the in the sector certainly one of the highest but they also have one of the highest grade gold mines in the world i think they're number three with eagle so so their skill sets are focused on eagle and kina and underground high grade mining um, and delivering value to their shareholders in that form the 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 sale of 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 uh, the moss project to us was not really strategic it was an investment that they sold that they would like to see a return on and it was part of the transaction as to how we acquired it they got paper and they got shares in our company and they'll get some more um but i think we need to be cognizant that they are they're they're not a strategic mining company they are an investor just like anyone else but they're a large investor and i respect their views and i meet with them offline uh, outside of the board, we give them updates as we would any 20% investor, and, uh, and 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 we're very collaborative. But I think long term, this again being an investment for them, they they'll, they'll want to see an exit for value uh, down the road um, at some at some stage. Other than West Dome and the board management, who are the key institutional shareholders of the company? Uh, the other key shareholders are uh, are, are Sprott. Um, uh, and there and 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 Middlefield and Extract Capital. Uh, there are, is a large European metals fund in uh, in 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 Germany that that have uh, a decent position in us. I, I think what we're go what we're going to see over the next little while is we're going to see a shift of more your European investors on the retail side because retail represents about half of our shareholder base. On the retail family office, high net worth, ultra high net worth, I think you're going to see that 50% distribution change more to Europe. Uh, so Europe will be probably half of it. Uh, US will be probably a quarter of it. And the remaining quarter will be Canada and other jurisdictions. But right now, Canada holds about 80% of it. And um, and I think what I'm looking for are shareholders that, you know, don't day trade and, you know, you know play around with the stock and put shorts on it. I'm after shareholders that believe in the story, believe in those five attributes because they're real and this will get rewarded in time. And like I say, this is, uh, this is there's no better entry point than today uh, being at, uh, at 20 cents. I think this is the, the time for, for shareholders to come in. And when, shareholder, when we were trading at 25 cents and I was marketing and said, there's going to be no better time, um, there, you know, Again, this is downside uh, protection. This is also short term, in my view. Uh, the pullback of the gold price is short term. There's an anticipation that interest rates are going to rise again, and they may. But we're at the peak of interest rate uh, rising. We are at the peak. They are going to stabilize and have to probably come down over the next five years, and that will kind of plug into with a trying to get down to four percent inflation, which will be difficult. I think it, it props gold up to you know two thousand dollars and and over. Um, for this period. So I just think we're, I've always said that gold's going to trade between $1,900 and $2,300 for the foreseeable future. We're down around the bottom and that's that's macro driven, that's geopolitically driven. We're going to kind of drive up towards the top. That that will also be macro and geopolitically driven, uh, but it also will be, uh, you know, it could also be, uh, you know, as a result of inflation and other, you know, economic factors that drive gold price. Moving on to the main segment, we will be diving deeper into the working plan and the geological potential for the Moss Gold project. Could you kind of outline in greater detail the potential to further grow both, you know, re I mean, mainly the resource of the high grade share, or right? you showcased that you have potential in the parallel at depth. What do you think will make sense to prioritize to do that? I think the first thing, you know, all, all things being equal, we have to uh, infill this to measure and indicate it so we can actually put a feasibility study in, uh, to, a, to a bankable level. Um, and from that will come a reserve. Um, once we're done that, and that is the priority because that's where the value is going to be created because that's going to demonstrate, you know, a project and, a, and, 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 and cash flow, visibility on cash flow. But if I had more money, 
if I had the ability to, to, to drill, our priorities would be stepping out to the Northeast and because there's been a lot of drilling done there, um, stepping out to the Northeast and trying to make the resource larger, like take the resource closer to 10 million ounces. And I think we could also do it at depth. And I, you know, I, I never felt this way six months ago, but I'm starting to feel this now. And, you know, maybe Pete uh, can agree with me. I think there's a priority to do deeper drilling here because I think there is a, there is a number of uh, factors where I think we can generate value. We can be mining at surface, these high grade shears, and we can be doing it along strike. And when we get outside of that current pit, we can, we can transition the current pit at 400 meters or 300 meters. We can start to put declines down and we can start to underground operations. So the transition from open pit to underground, I think really needs to be looked at because quite frankly, um, you know, underground mining is efficient. Uh, open pit mining can be efficient, um, but I think we'll we'll get a better bang for our buck uh, looking at when that transition is. I always said it would be 20 years out, and it may well be 20 years out. But I think we have to do the engineering to to understand if that if that's actually true. Um, these shears are so attractive. Some of these shears are 25 meters wide, um, uh, in 30 meters wide, and they outcrop on the Trans Canada Highway, so we can see them physically see them, Pete has pictures of them, and I want to get them into our presentation because you see this wall rock that the Trans-Canada Highway is cut out of, and you can clearly see the diorite, and you can clearly see all the sheared up, uh, the sheared up sulfide material, uh, and it's, it's like night and day. Uh, it, it, it's literally like night and day, and there's a 25, 30 meter section of it on the highway that probably has anywhere from one to 20 grams, and there's another section of the diorite section where it's probably got anywhere from 0.3 to 0.9. And uh, that is kind of the, that is uh, the, the, the most visible, uh, the most visible uh, you know, way you can see our deposit. So it's, it's easy to understand that geological potential is not the constraint, but it, it's rather the capital at this, uh, at this stage. For uh, you. Absolutely, it's the capital. You know, we should be, we should be running seven drill rigs right now. We should have four infilling moss. We should have two to the northeast scout drilling and bringing a, a bigger resource to the table. And we should have one rig where we want it. And to, to me, that would probably be at North Coldstream right now because I would love to punch 10 holes in the North Coldstream and try and come up with a, a maiden resource of copper and cobalt. Again, free option, great optionality. Uh, test some other targets like Iris um, and, uh, and, and Vanguard and see if there is, you know, is there a connection, whether there's potential there as well. You know, if CapEx, if, if, if capital was available, we'd be doing all of those things. And, you know, we, would, we wouldn't be a two or $300 million company. We would be a seven or $800 million company because I think we're gonna deliver on all that, all that potential. Um, you know, maybe, I, I, you know, you, you asked earlier about, you know, why, why are we so disconnected from the market? You know, I, I, I just speak the truth and I just speak my view. And, you know, maybe people think it's overly optimistic, but I've done this for 35, 36 years. Um, I know when I see something that is, you know, of tremendous value and this is of tremendous value. And, and, and you know, I, I, I can't explain that to people enough that this is not going to run into roadblocks that are not manageable. This is going to always run, everything runs into roadblocks, but those challenges within the base of opportunity we have are, 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 are easily overcome. And, and I think, yes, looking at the potential, we would be drilling this so that, hey, maybe, maybe we would scope this differently. We can only scope the PEA now to something that we, can, we think we can finance. And, and um, that's a five or $600 million CapEx project we could easily drill this out to 25 million ounces and put together a $2 billion CapEx project, but I can't build it because I don't have the equity value to be able to raise the equity necessary to do it. And I don't like being in the situation where your only exit, your only option is a takeout. Uh, I don't like being in that position. And you can drill forever, and I think it starts to destroy value. People need to see visibility to a project, cash flow, a return on their investment. That's what they need to see. 
let's kind of paint up a, a few different scenarios after we've uh, handled the current budgets. You have 6 million Canadian in the Treasury right now. Can you just clearly define how that will be deployed within this year? So kind of reaching the PEA in a few months beyond. Yeah, I, I think the cost of the, the, the of the PEA will... You know, between all the studies we're doing, the MET test work, the advanced MET test work we're doing, uh, we want to start column testing um, so we can test the theory of heap leach. Uh, you know, I, I think that's probably order of magnitude, a million and a half to $2 million over the course of the next six, seven months. Uh, we have other costs, obviously. Um, we are doing environmental baseline work. We're doing uh, some summer um, data collection uh, just some uh, some targeting, some geochem chem sampling. You know, we're doing what we can with as little capital as we need, and and because otherwise, you know, we 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 should be drilling, and and that is that is the different. We're trying to kind of keep our core group of people uh, and keep them busy and keep them looking at you know how we're going to create value when we can go raise capital, and then it's really about. You know, I, I, I maybe I'm leading the question here, but the question really needs to be answered is where where is that capital going to come from? And, and I think one of my priorities between now and in the fall of 2023 is identifying where that's going to come from. And that may well be from uh, it may well be from a joint venture partner. And, and I have always said that, you know, we're not ready to joint venture because we can do this on our own. Uh, the reality is I need to protect the downside in the event we can't do it on our own. And that's only going to be protected by having somebody come in like a West Dome, uh, but but not West Dome. Somebody come in and say, hey, Brett, we, we agree with your vision. Uh, we see a different number, but we see a big number. Um, and, you know, happy to have you prove it to us. And And, and we will we will uh, provide the necessary capital to get you to that point. And that is allowing them to earn into 19.9% of the company. Um, and over the course of two years, uh, maybe two and a half years, we would look to draw down uh, and raise capital from a joint venture partner um, because the capital markets are just not reliable. The flow through markets are reliable, but the, the hard dollar capital market is not reliable. So if we look at it very seriously, because we are serious investors here, so two, three million Canadian dollars to get the PEA out and for all, all activities, activities in the interim. And there is a freeze on drilling, essentially, for now, until the PEA is released. So you, st you still have two, three million Canadian left after that. So you, if worse comes to worse, you, you will be fine. You will still be able to incubate this project until things get gets better, because every Everyone can clearly see that this is this is cheap. This is a cheap project, yeah, excellent project. So that should not be an issue from your point of view. No, the the answer is yes. Uh, you're right. Um, I we are in capital preservation mode since about December, when we did our second last raise. I, I basically said, okay, Pete, we need to drill uh, in January and in the first week of February because we need to fill in some areas so that we can put a resource out, which we did. We drilled until February. We burned a lot through our, all our money. Uh, we had to raise money again in April. Um, and from, but from December on, aside from the drilling, it was like, if, if you're not an essential service, if you're not an essential uh, cost, we, we're, we're going to, we, we, we need to, you know, uh, uh, put it in abeyance. So we let a lot of people go. We let over 25 people go. Um, we, um, we, we decommissioned a lot of the things we were doing. We stopped. Um, we stopped uh, on on some of the I'll say more advanced studies, and just focused on what was going to deliver the two catalysts this year: the MRE, um, which we did on May eighth, and the PEA, which will come in September. So those are the two things we're focused on. If anything that people do, or services do, or or anything else that don't provide a service to delivering on those two things, we we've we put them in abeyance. We're, we're in capital preservation mode. And yes, um, if we got desperate, uh, I know that insiders and management are, are comfortable enough to, to fund this company to remain solvent at any cost. And, and you know, I'm, I'm a big I'm a big shareholder, as you know. And you know, if I had to put another million dollars into this, I would. And 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 I, I but I really don't think that 
This is a company that is going to go into distress. This is the last company that should go into distress, but I'm not anticipating we're going to get out of this this year. Um, I think this is a, uh, a, a late next year kind of thing. So I now have to prepare, how do I raise capital? How do I keep this company going for that period? How do I manage that downside? And joint venturing with somebody who has a decent balance sheet who can uh, provide us with the development capital is very important. And that is, you know, I, I'm a, a big talker about speed to market. Speed to market is extremely important when it comes to, you know, d delivering and returning value to shareholders. The longer, you know, junior mining companies sit on their butt and don't do anything, it just erodes value. Um, and, and I don't want to be that guy. I want to be that guy that continues to develop, continues to deliver and, and delivers a return to shareholders as quickly as possible. Assuming you source funding from a joint venture, you're know, raising capital off the PEA, how will that be deplo deployed post PEA? Do you have a kind of a plan now? Where, where will you pr prioritize drilling into environmental studies, you know, into PFS? You need to prioritize probably, I think, but what, what's your thinking there? Yeah, absolutely do. And, and that's what the guys are doing right now. So, and that's, that's very useful information to be doing is that, you know, where does the first million dollars get spent? Where's the first $5 million get spent? Where's the first $10 million get spent? How do we break it up? Um, there's a lot of, if, if, if we didn't have 22 gold targets and three VMS targets and, and North Gold Stream, it'd be much easier. We would just drill at Moss, but we need to drill at Moss. Um, one thing I can say is we probably wouldn't do any drilling at East Cold Stream. I don't think it hits the priority list above, you know, above North Cold Stream, above, you know, Moss to the Northeast or Moss to the Southeast or Moss to the Northwest, consolidating Moss and yes, infill drilling, but infill drilling and then doing step outs around Moss is going to deliver the most value. That's the first thing. Second thing is I think drilling the North Cold Stream and possibly testing the other VMS deposits is also a priority because that can lead to a strategic uh, decision that maybe we want to spin the company out into a base metals company, you know, call it Copper Shore Resources. And, um, and, and you know, raise capital on its own because it's a different dynamic. If the sum of the parts makes more sense than the individual parts being separated, then we would keep it in. But drilling it is, is, is one of the priorities. So, yeah, I think we have a plan for what, what 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, how we, how we prioritize that because it may come in like that and we need to be able to deploy that capital, you know, in the, in the best way possible. Just to give everyone a sense, what is the drilling cost per meter for you guys currently? So we ran 79,000 meters and our discovery costs were $10 all in. Uh, so on 6 million ounces, we spent $60 million, including the acquisition costs. Uh, as a metric, that is probably the top of class. Um, if we wanted to go just discovery costs, just our drilling costs, probably closer to 6 or $7. And again, top of class, but let's break that down. We, we were paying $180 a meter, um, all in probably closer to 300. <clears throat> I know it's less than 300, but it, we, we like to be conservative. Let's call it 300. We had drilling contractors, just a, drilling alone, quote us 300, 400, $500. When we were working with this company from Quebec, tremendous performance, two weeks on, one week off, tremendous performance. And, um, and the cheapest drilling that I saw last year and the year before. Our partners and our friends and our, our colleagues who are working in Nevada, in Idaho, uh, working in New Mexico, working in Mexico, uh, British Columbia, I didn't hear any numbers less than $250 a meter for drilling costs and all in closer to 400. They were the best and we were 300. So I think from a drilling cost standpoint, we, we hit it out of the park. Let's talk about next year. Let's say that you have $10 million for, for an exploration budget, full budget. <clears throat> how would you, um, how would you split that between advancing towards, you know, infill drilling and a PFS that would cost how many million dollars and 
how much would you be able to um, to budget for you know district type drilling or extension you know parallel share type drilling as well at Moss? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think if you ask Pete the question, he's going to have a different answer. But I, I think you have to prioritize seventy percent of your capital to you know, advancing the project through to construction, and so seventy percent of our capital would be infill drilling Moss to measured indicated. Uh, and that is, if he said we had 20 million, it would still be 70% because I think the infill costs are going to be about $20 million. We probably want to spend another $5 million on uh, on on uh, regional drilling, a long strike from Moss that will get pulled into a larger resource because obviously another MRE is going to deliver value. If we show 8 million or 10 million ounces, then that's again, a different company and we start to cross that psychological threshold of 10 million ounces. So scout, you no, know, it's not really scout drilling. It's really definition drilling uh, out, out to the northeast of, of Moss. It will deliver value. To the southwest, a little bit of value. And in between the main zone and the southwest zone, there is a area there that we need to get up on top of the tundra in the wintertime and drill. Um, that's why I would say $6 million for a drill program this winter. Then go back to the well for you know another drill program in the spring summer. Um, so yeah, making Moss bigger, seventy percent of the capital would be spent there. Uh, testing North Cold Stream, ten percent of the capital would be put there. Um, testing the, the share, parallel shears uh, along Strike um, is about ten percent, and I would say ten percent contingency that I'm probably gonna probably gonna want to drill some of the other. Uh, uh, you know, gold targets with if uh, if things are going well at Moss and we're, we get we hit our, our numbers. Um, I think the, the the 10 million number is a psychological barrier. I think you could spend another 10 million dollars and get uh, 12 million ounces. And I don't think you'd you, you, you cross any psychological barrier. But new discoveries, that's game changing stuff. And uh, that's what we would go for. We would go for the big swing. Getting into the PEA, you have a great open pit resource. Can you give everyone an expectation of, you know, the footprint? That's the first kind of decision you have to make because you have constraints with capital, the size of the company, etc. What kind of throughput, you know, size of plant, mine life, production profile will you probably define in the PEA? I guess, you know, the, you, you do this from a bottleneck standpoint. What's the bottleneck? The bottleneck is our cap structure and the capital required to be raised in equity for a, any project. And we've set that threshold at $500 million. Now, $500 million of project capital is kind of where, where we've set it. Yes, we could build bigger. And yes, we could probably build smaller. Um, and we may have to consider that, but I think we just want the optimum and 500 million CapEx is that optimum. Now you start working backwards from there. How much are you, so and then we have this scenario is heap leach going to come into it now, or is we going to have to come into it later? So, do we? Is it a whole ore leach for everything? Um, is that what it looks like, or are there permutations of that? And the and, and the permutations at the end of the day are 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 are, are actually there, there's quite a few that that Asenko and 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 Pete are are kind of working on, and they 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 range from kind of that uh, I'm going to say. <laughs> five to 10,000 ton a day operation to 10 to 30,000 ton a day and trying to determine whether, whether, um, whether a heap leach fits into that again, just tons and tons of permutations. Um, yeah. And where do we land at the end of the day? I, I think we land at a 25,000 ton a day plant, a 200,000 ounce profile. We're not reverse engineering this as far as production goes. We're re reverse engineering it on capital. And um, uh, yeah, a, a 200,000 ounce producer, um, $1,000 all in sustaining costs. Um, that to me feels like a five to $600 million CapEx project. And um, yeah, sort of order of magnitude, um, you know, that's a, $200 million free cash flow company. It's a billion dollar NPV and a 32% IRR. Um, those are all back of the napkin numbers. They're in my head. 
but we we will probably come out with two or three scenarios. There will be um, there will be a, a stockpiling of low grade and, and a whole or leach on the balance. There will be a heap leach, whole or leach. There will be uh, a whole or leach and and uh, you know stockpiling uh, for a dump leach. You know where we we line it and we irrigate later, preparing uh, dumps for for leaching, um, but not leaching right away. Uh, given the the other additional capital required, that all makes sense to me. Uh, irrigating at another time all makes sense to me. So uh, there's like I say, there's there's a number of permutations here that we that we just need to to flush out. It's early days. We're two weeks into it, so it's still early days on the scenario planning. So will the methodological test work for, you know, heap leaching the lower grade intrusion material be, that will, that will not be ready for the PEA, I assume? It's not going to be. We're going to have a lot of testing to support it, like coarse bottle rolls, pretty decent recovery, like 50%. Um, does that lead us to believe that, you know, we, we would get 60 or 65% in a, in a, in a, in a, a heap leach, it, possibly? But I don't want to throw those numbers out there until we do column testing and Column testing takes about 160 days. Every your 30 day leach cycle, your next 30, your next 30. And then you look at the recoveries at 120 and 150 to determine where the cutoff is. And you have to run, you know, various blended co uh, composites to, uh, to, to understand that it's representative of the whole ore body so that you're not getting wild swings and recoveries based on either geological uh, differences or, 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 or other metallurgical differences in the ore. It strikes me as you're using capital costs as the kind of constraint here. So you're using that because you want to showcase that you can feasibly do this yourself. You don't want to be reliant on a takeout scenario right away. Uh, but in, in, in the PFS, when you guys start to re-rate again to more realistic levels, at that point, you believe that you will kind of start to expand the footprint and make this into a larger operation since the... I mean, this is a district after all, as you say. Yeah, I, I think we will absolutely prepare, you know, uh, our, our sterilization drilling um, to respect the fact that we may have three, three or four or five different plants here. We'll make sure that when we lay this out, it's conducive to building a big district scale uh, camp that can receive ore from many places. So, you know, we may be trucking ore for 20 kilometers um that is that that does really make sense to me when you have all of these targets and you're able to uh, to identify them put a resource around them and then you know bring them into production that really really does make a lot of sense but it, you know that that process takes a long time and i'm trying to get a project into production as soon as possible and then yeah i'll explore all the other options but keeping in mind that when you do put this into production, you know, your footprint's going to be, you know, five times the size. Just remember that uh, because you don't want to constrain the potential by just not having, you know, the layout proper, uh, properly uh, conceived or the sterilization. And I've run into this before where, you know, um, companies have built, you know, the processing plants on top of, you know, two gram ore body and they, they can't get at it because uh, the plant's there. I, you know, it's crazy, but it's true. In terms of East Coldstream, you will not include any hub and spoke kind of uh, shipping of ore in the PEA. So we, so we will, uh, we, we don't, because, because we don't have, there's, there's the PEA that is the, it is a snapshot in time today. And does, does East Coldstream have to sequence in? It probably does. Um, and it will sequence in in year five, something like that, maybe, maybe later. Um, so for a 12 or 13 or 14 year mine life, and I'm not, I'm not worried about you. Know, the, part of the question was about mine life. I'm not worried about mine life. I am worried about, um, you know, keeping a, an open mind for how big this can potentially be and making decisions with that in mind. So for our snapshot today, East Coldstream figures in, let's call it year five, six or seven, it'll come in. Uh, it'll go to a certain depth and then it'll become less economic than some other place and we'll move and go to some other place. And that's the snapshot we have today. And go, by other place, I mean back to Moss, whether it be QES or Maine or, or, or Southwest Zone. <clears throat> that, that's the snapshot we have today. In reality, 
the focus on the development drilling to the northwest and bringing resources in there uh, all the way down to depth uh, is 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 important because that just pushes out the East Cold Stream uh, integration. So from a mining perspective, mining guys will do that. From a project perspective, it's, I only have a snapshot of what I know today. But from an operating perspective, I know what we're going to do in order to maximize profit and, 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 and cash flow. How do the environmental baseline studies connect to the environmental assessment to outline the timeline for permitting? As you know, we've talked about ESG in the past and we've talked about kind of the work we're doing environmentally and, 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 and also socially. And I think they're interconnected and they're also extremely important. Um, I see them as, you know, a fabric of our company. Uh, I don't see them as, you know, a, a box ticking exercise or, or something we have to do. And, and Pete kind of feels the same way and he's on the ground delivering and doing all this stuff. So when it comes to environmental work, um, you know, we started the, our environmental baseline work before we even listed in June of 2021. So we could have as much baseline data as possible and in the critical kind of phase one uh, category. So you collect data for three years. Um, it supports um, um, the work that you do for an impact assessment. Um, and it all dovetails into your permitting process. So you're doing your impact assessment and there's a number of studies, uh, both engineering studies and environmental studies that have to be done but you've collected all the data to support that uh, leading up to it. And that process can be, can be timely. Uh, it can be a year, it can be a couple of years on top of the, you know, the three years of data that we've done so far. And, uh, and, and, and that stamp, that, that, that's important from a permitting standpoint. And again, as you go through it, we're looking for risk, we're managing risk and we're trying to identify any critical flaws and there are none. And, and the water is not a critical flaw. There's no flora or fauna or species at risk. So we, we tick that box. But I think the single most important thing about ESG is the relationship we have with our host community, First Nations. And we started that process before we owned the project as well. And we started to meet and collaborate and include our First Nations in our business. And we had come, we have come to two exploration agreements with our host community, First Nations, um, Lac de Malac and Lac La Croix. And they, um, they, uh, they are very supportive, but that we also work with them uh, in the community. We hire of priority First Nations people in unskilled roles. So that's the first thing. And we had several First Nations uh, working with us last year. In skilled roles, they get an opportunity um, simply because they need to be uh, they need to be um, you know a, a part of the fabric of our organization. So you know if if uh, commercially uh, an individual has the skill set and the experience and they get priority over that. The same as contracts, we work with them and we work with First Nations affiliated contractors because it provides them again with economic stimulation from the, the contractor we use. So all of these things are about building a sustainable environment for our host communities while we're there and we're sharing. And, and, and all these things will all lead to an IBA, a Indigenous Benefits Agreement, um, whereby we talk a little bit more serious about uh, the impact and the sharing uh, requirement of, uh, of a, a mining company and a host community First Nations relative to you know, a big operation that's generating, you know, tons of money that can come in the form of employment. It can come in the form of contracting and it can, can come in the form of some form of participation. So we're, we're setting a stage for all of that so that in a year's time, we can start those negotiations and we can start that permitting process and we can move this down the road. And that's why focusing on MOS is so important is because it's the closest to, that we have to near-term cash flow. Longer term, used to give people a sense, but the, the benefit agreement to reach an, a, a solid agreement that will be like three years out or something like that. Or... Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. An impact assessment is something similar, probably. Yeah, I, I think it would be completed three years out. So if you're talking 2026, uh, you know, what are we, May 25th? 
2026. Uh, 20, yeah, that, that's the time frame when you're starting to look at, you know, putting project financing together and finalizing your permitting with the minister uh, and, uh, you know, getting ready to announce, uh, you know, a project and, uh, and, and providing, you know, you, you probably went out and raised, you know, $50 million of pre, pre project uh, financing to start the site preparation things you can do before you actually get a permit um to to uh, to, to to operate so i think your timing is right on the money just to give people a sense if it's going to be you guys doing this yourselves a fast track timeline would be you know construction decision maybe maybe three and a half four years something like that if, if everything goes very smoothly i think that's right three three and a half years is probably the right answer uh, and yeah, a, a year to build something and depending on seasonality, um, you know, probably a year to build things. The procurement is going to be in parallel to that. Um, probably also a year, uh, to get, to get gear and to get the equipment. Uh, we're, we're approaching the PEA as if, you know, we're going to be mining it ourselves, not use contract mining, uh, and not use any other kind of significant contract work, uh, with the exception of, uh, you know, possibly maintenance and, some other, I'll say OEM or, or vendor, uh, vendor serviced uh, uh, agreements. For the final segment, we will hone in on the outlook for potential joint venture agreements, M&A, and wrap up with the five-year vision for Goldshore. And you're talking about the joint venture. Could you kind of give some color on what that would look like, you think, in terms of uh, how, how, my, how much of the pro project will be li relinquished to that partner? Or sure. I, I don't think any partner, and if I was the partner to having this discussion with you, I would say, you know, I'd be comfortable to earning in a position uh, over a period of time to 19.9%. And today that would be 40 million shares. Tomorrow that'll be 70 million shares. And I would be willing to, you know, to invest whatever I need to. Uh, and I will give the company the benefit of the doubt so I don't blow out the equity story. And and I would say, okay, well, we'll sign an agreement that allows for the company to draw down uh, at their you know mutually agreed to budgets, uh, draw down twice a year on bringing up um, that strategic partner to nineteen point nine percent. So maybe it's a million dollars of new equity uh, on signing, and maybe it's six million dollars in the fall for a drill campaign through the winter. Maybe it's $6 million in the spring uh, for another drill, continue on with the drill program. And maybe it's 7 to $10 million in the fall of 2024. Uh, and then we see where they are as far as the percentage goes. We look at our budget going forward and, uh, and, and, you know, and we see where the capital markets are then because they may be wide open and gold may be running at 2,200 bucks and, and multiples may have you know, done five times money. If I can go back to the market on that kind of multiple, you know, on a two dollar one fifty share price, you know, I, I'm absolutely going to go to the market um, and uh, and and balance off my strategic partner. So I think that's what it looks like. My timeline's two and a half years to three years, but I, I, as an investment, um, I think I would have to allow a joint venture partner in within two years to allow them to earn in. But they do it on our timing, and that gives the share price time to increase and time to bet in based on, you know, based on the news flow and based on, you know, the perceived value in the market. We're going to have two new metrics to maybe three, but a couple of new metrics to value Goldshore after the PEA, because at PEA, you can value companies at two times cash flow. Um, so, you know, if, if this company is doing $200 million a year, and that's not a, that's not a, um, a, a mistake on the screen, that's a real number. On a, based on a thousand dollar cost, a two thousand dollar gold price, a thousand dollar margin, and two hundred thousand dollar production profile, two hundred thousand ounces a year. That's a two hundred million dollar free cash flow company, and two times cash flow is a four hundred million market cap company. And today we're at forty. So I talk about the upside of getting to where the PEA is going to give that valuation metric. That's the delta. Uh, I could also be 0.3 times NPV, and on a you know on on that type of project. That is going to be very, very close to a billion dollar MPV. Um, and that's a 300 million, 0.3 times that is a 300 market cap company. So you take 300, you take you know, 400, 
you take you know a, a dollar per ounce basis of somewhere near our peer group at call it call it forty dollars or fifty dollars an ounce times uh, you know six million ounces, uh, which may be eight million ounces by then. That's also a three hundred million dollar company or four hundred million dollar company. So all the valuation metrics that investors use to calibrate you know doability, mineability, and the viability of projects and companies we're going to have out there. And all those point to the same direction. And that is we should be a company that's eight to 10 times our size today. And, and you know, I, I know that sounds so dramatic and it is dramatic. It's a dramatic change, but we're so uncoupled with the market today that um, we're just going to wake up one day and our share price is going to run. We're not going to know why. And, and it's just going to be that point in time when the market gets it. Do you think that it's um, it will make sense to, to, to try to secure a joint venture before the PEA or will you kind of try to hold off after the PEA and see if the market wakes up to the value here and you can instead raise money on your own? What's the thinking there? Yeah, I, I think I think we're active now. Um, I think we're, we're talking now. Um, we would like to see, you know, something put in place. Timing is not either before the PEA or after the PEA. I don't think it's that material because the initial investment to just sign a, a deal would be very, very small. It would not be, you know, no, it wouldn't be a big equity blowout. So I, I, I don't know that it's relatively that important. Um, there are points of view that say, you know, maybe we should merge. There's a consolidation argument in our sector that, you know, that is, um, you know, it's real, you know, it's a, and, and there should be fewer companies out there. Uh, having, achieving that is not easy. Not everybody wants to come to the party. Not everybody wants to dance when they come to the party. And I'm prepared to to dance on on the table. And and nobody really wants to to engage like that. There are some uh, that will, but again, everybody thinks their project is the best in the world. And you know, I've just described to you what I think is a, one of the projects that is top quartile for sure, for sure. Um, so I don't want to merge. Um, as a merger of equals with somebody that's on the bottom quartile, because I'm going to disappoint my shareholders that I've just diluted them down for no reason uh, with a with a project that is less valuable. So um, I have to go through that exercise and uh, and evaluate what is available and and how we can you know what what a combined company looks like. I go through that exercise. I don't have a business development department or person. Um, I do that myself and I, I, Pete and I take the meetings and, and I think we're a pretty good business development team, um, because we've looked at a lot of these projects before. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's trying to come up with assessing them through those five attributes, assessing them from, uh, what the capital markets think, what the analysts think, and, uh, and then, you know, trying to come up with your own view. That's how we, that's how we kind of break it down. Doing a deep dive on it is like the next stage, but getting to that deep dive is is a process that takes time. So yes, a, a long answer to your question is I think joint venturing will be you know likely this year, uh, whether it's next month or whether it's six months from now. I don't have the answer to that. Um, these things take time. People like to digest information, and you know let's face it, the majors are not in any hurry. Um, and you know, a lot of them are not very supportive. There are, there are certain JVs and you can look at the barracks of the world and the Agnico's of the world. Agnico must have, you know, I, I have no idea how many, but they probably have 20 or 25 joint ventures. Alamos have, have some, Yamana used to have some, um, you know, a Cisco, you know, there's a lot of those partnership styles, uh, B2 have just done one with snow, snow line. So there's a lot of the mid tiers and senior producers that, that that do this, but you know I also get it that it's very difficult to manage big portfolios of big projects. It's not easy. You have to sequence them in the in the pipeline. You have to sequence the priority of capital and people and resources. It takes time. So they don't all need uh, the next big thing, uh, but but somebody will, and and we'll just keep talking and and sharing and and seeing. Uh, you know what fits with who, and whether we fit with 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 whoever. Uh, I think that's just going to take a time. So we're going through that process, 
uh, as expeditiously as we can and with our eyes wide open in this market. So, um, so yeah, um, I, I think that's, um, it, it's, it would help give credibility to the project and protect the downside of capital raising in the future. I met you here in Stockholm, and, but just to share some information for everyone else, how many visits are you getting to site? What is the activity like? Yeah, you know, I, we, 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 don't, we don't disclose that information, but I can, uh, I can say that, yes, there are active site visits. Um, there are, you know, many, many NDAs in, in, under, under, in place with a number of mining companies. So I think everybody's out there looking and we're, we're, we're talking and we're probably more active than we otherwise would be in a normal market. Um, so, but again, it takes time. Um, you have to dedicate time, money, resources, capital to doing your due diligence to make sure you can have a, a recommendation that is supported and the arguments supported and the business case is supported and, and that you, that, that the stories go together and, you know, we wouldn't want to be something that doesn't work for a joint venture partner. Uh, we want to be something that, that, that works with them. Uh, obviously, if there was a future relationship or transaction as a result of that, that's probably a good result for the good sh gold shore shareholders. Um, if we get to build this mine and it's still under kind of a 20% a ownership or 29% ownership by someone else, um, then that's also a good scenario. Again, we're, we're always, I'm always trying to look at what the fastest way and the best way is to create value for our shareholders. And, and, you know, up to and including, um, you know, any, any potential transaction. And then finally to wrap up, because we have just now, you know, the potential to have a joint venture, but we also see acquisitions taking place for earlier stage projects, uh, in North America. So what do you expect? Let me, I mean, do, do you see any interest to, to get acquired? Do you see this as a possibility for you guys or are you open-minded to it? Do you think it's a, a likelihood, say, in the coming 12 to 18 months? Uh, that's a tough one because, you know, I, I look at the way the market is performing right now and I look at the way, you know, the market perceives deals right now. Um, I think, yeah, it would be uh, in the next 12 months, I think it would be a difficult uh, question to answer. Um, do I think it's going to happen? No, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, are Are they preparing? Um, you know, are we in discussions? Well, we're in discussions with a lot of mining companies, probably, you know, I would say probably eight out of the top 10, uh, maybe 15 out of the top 20. Um, we're, we're in discussions with a lot of, uh, companies. They see anytime you have 6 million ounces in a path for 10 or 20, people are going to get, everybody's going to be interested in it. So there's interest. It's actually taking that interest and calibrating that into value for us in a, in a joint venture partnership or, you know, you know, or maybe just a straight trade sale. Um, I'm not interested in selling this company until I deliver value to every one of my shareholders, including the 65 cent shareholders. So, so we're not doing anything um, to, uh, to and giving away value. We'll preserve this. We'll 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 deliver value to our shareholders in time, uh, and, and that's why I've asked for. I've asked for two and a half years, three years, uh, to be able to do that because all of the activities we have over the next two and a half, three years to get us to a better point uh, and a higher valuation, uh, you know, we're, we're naturally going to do. And I, I think that's the time when we would start to consider exits uh, before actually construction. You have to make a commitment one way or another. And if you have a partner, that partner says, hey, I want you to build it. Great. If that partner says, you know what, hold off, I want you to drill, we'd probably drill. Um, and, you know, take this to 15 or, or take us to however many ounces we, we had capital for. And they're, they're just using us as their exploration group to prepare a project for production that they want to put in production. And they'd probably do a different PEA they probably or a feasibility study. They'd probably do it on a much larger production profile. People want 500,000 ounces a year. They want them for generations. And um, that's where, what we're, that would be what we would, uh, might be asked to do. And we have the size and the scale to do it. So we might be asked to do that. So an exit strategy today, not ideal. Uh, an exit strategy when we were full value with a big premium. Yeah, we would consider that as everyone everyone would, but we got to put our head down and we got to deliver 
uh, this PEA, and we've got to you know create some value, uh, which I think is the only way we're going to be able to create value is by delivering the economic results of that, and then moving forward with uh, with some sort of joint venture partner. So the final question, which we all always like to ask, is where do you envision Gold Shore in five years from now? Because you and the board are extremely committed to the company. You really want to create shareholder value. What kind of business or company do you, do you see Goldshore being in five years from now? I hope it is a multi-asset, single producing mine company that we have poured first gold at, at Moss, that we are preparing for phase two of Moss, uh, which is a couple of year process. We have another project in the pipeline of similar status, uh, maybe low grade open pit uh, project in North America. Uh, that dovetails nicely with us, that has good grade. Um, I may or may not be, you know, the guy driving the bus because transactions sometimes need to bring in, you know, need to bring in other people. Um, I'm, as a, long as I am a shareholder uh, to the extent of this company, and maybe I end up five or 6% of this company, I will be involved in it and I will, I will guide it and I will watch it and I will advise as I need to. If I'm the CEO, that's awesome. I want to build a mine. I'd love to build this mine. Uh, I'd love to put the boots back on and get up to Thunder Bay and 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 drive our process with a, with a proper project team. Love putting project teams together. Pete does as well. Um, so yeah, I'd like to I'd like to be in that position five years from now, where we have an operating mine. We have we're preparing phase two, and we have a second asset in our pipeline, and we're trading uh, without rollbacks or anything like that we're trading circa uh, some order of magnitude about five dollars four dollars on a 300 million share base so that's a 1.2 billion dollar company and i think that is appropriate um for that size of company 200,000 ounce producer spinning off 200 million dollars of free cash flow a year that's a 1.2 billion dollar company for sure for sure so that's a that's it's aggressive. It's a, it's ambitious, but I can see I've built companies that have gone through this, maybe at different gold gold periods in the gold cycle. But I, I've I've been there. We 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 have done this, and uh, it does take a lot of hard work, and, and 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 it does take a little bit of good luck in the market. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna take risks in this sector, you need to have great rewards, and that's what you're painting up here. So exactly right. Thank you for coming on and presenting to our investors, Fabrat. Gorm, it's been my pleasure and I hope to do, we get back and do it again soon, okay? 